Welcome to The D-List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. And I think we're overdue for a return to the musical world of MST3K. A few years ago, I listed my favorite songs from the original run of Mystery Science Theater 3000 in anticipation of the then-upcoming revival, a revival that ended up having even more songs written by such extraordinary talents as Paul and Storm and that guy who's the youngest, quickest EGOT and the only double EGOT. Jeez, Bobby, leave some talent for the rest of us. And now there's another revival on the way, complete with its own streaming service and a rotating cast. Multiple casts for Mystery Science Theater? My lifelong dream of playing Tom Servo just might be achievable after all. Come on, I can have a mighty voice. I'm good enough to receive a giant banner from someone complaining that they hate Tom Servo's new voice. I can be the new voice that they hate. I even have experience talking one-on-one -on -one with an expert on that mighty voice. So to celebrate MSC3K building its new home where it doesn't have to answer to the whims of a larger network, it's time to visit the last in a string of networks to cancel it, Netflix. Here's my ranking of all the songs from The Return and The Gauntlet, the two Netflix seasons of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Number 14. So in my earlier list, I only included songs in host segments, not musical moments in the theater itself. But then in the Netflix seasons, they started actually doing a few full songs in the theater with instruments and credits at the end, so those gotta be included. Guys, this is really tripping me out. Check out those lights, yeah. Look, some movies just have long, dull, repetitive stretches that are hard to fill with new jokes, so what better way to fill those stretches than with a musical number that would have made the movie itself far more entertaining had it just been included in the first place? I'm just saying, there's a lot of MST2K movies that would have been infinitely more watchable if they were musicals. I've already got my pitch all set for Puma Man, Turn Off the Dark. And when they got to this stretch in Lords of the Deep, yeah, visuals this trippy definitely call for a sitar. Gum could be cheese. I like cheese. Wow. Wow. I think I'll just go to sleep for a while right here. It's a short little number, but it's exactly what was needed to get us through this poor man's 2001 A Sea Odyssey nonsense. Number 13. When Keog the Bear Cub escapes from the movie that eventually led to Cave Dwellers, he wreaks havoc on the satellite of love until he's brought back down to Moon 13. Help! Oh, I can't bear this! Literally! Oh, why'd you have to take our Keog? You can't keep a dangerous B-movie monster up there! Max bonds with him, but the bear is taken away by Dr. St. Five, so Max announces that he will mourn the only way he knows how. Guess it's time for my heartfelt song of goodbye. There's a cut on my hand and a pain in my heart. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> There's a cut on my hand and a pain in my heart. My feedback is empty. Where shall I start? But then it cuts away, so all we get is that one stanza. Still, nice to see Max carries on his father's tradition of singing mournfully about critters that were taken away from him. Nummy muffin, so butter. Number 12. What do you do when a movie hurts too much? How do you fix the broken places you can't touch? After falling in love with the giant monster Yongari and watching him murdered cruelly and heartlessly, Jonah and the bots are even more disheartened than usual and they just have to sing about it. And their depression drives them to use one of my favorite devices in comedy songwriting, clunky metaphors. Like you're haunted by a monster, but the monster is a movie about a monster who will not leave you alone. Push past the hurting. The time is now to please push past the hurting. And in the grand tradition of Manos the Hands of Fate, even the mad start to feel some guilt as they come in with the bridge. Is it wrong this torment that we've wrought? Maybe we should be giving some thought to, to repenting and doing, doing some, some good for a change. Is it too much to ask? Is it really so strange? Two evil leopards finally changing their 
Of course, they don't feel it for very long. Nah. <laughs> Push the button, Max. And then they cut the song short, which is funny, but really leaves me feeling unsatisfied. Come on, give us a final chorus to resolve this musically. My ears are on the edge of their seat. Is this part of the torture, Matt? Number 11. In the end of the finale of the Gauntlet season, Jonah and the bots are being loaded up for the then-upcoming live tour, but on his way out, he has his revenge on the Mads by hoisting them on their own petard. <laughs> All the old experiments! <laughs> Every episode! <laughs> A theater at the end of the storage facility? And don't Who knew? I wasn't in the garden with Mr. and Mrs. Adam. But the victory is hollow as Jonah and the bots spend the end credits singing about their continued suffering. Hours and hours of pain. Our sanity's run down the drain. Now the only thing left in my brain is your horrible show. Your show stinks. They do get briefly interrupted by a classic. Idiot control now. Idiot control now. Nitty on the road now. Also, I guess nobody in MST3K can return to Earth without at least mentioning Hamdingers. Our souls have been sent through the ringer, limping cold like an old Hamdinger. We've been stripped to the bone by Kinger in a horrible show. Number 10. After a very catchy song in the first episode of the revival, the next few episodes didn't really have much in the way of songs, but we'd make up for that in episode 4, Avalanche, which has two songs. Let's start with the second. Ladies and gentlemen, the Satellite of Love presents Aloha! Okay, this is less of a comedy song and more of a sketch that has some singing in it, but it's on the soundtrack, so it counts. You can cry, wondering why that guy said goodbye, but snow gets in your eye. In this segment, which might be named after a repeated refrain in the film. Oh, she's having an aneurysm. That's charming. It's like a 70s kitchen got up and danced. Dear TripAdvisor, spent a magical weekend with the owner's mother. She's a bright, sassy lady. Seemed to think we were in Hawaii. We get to hear Florence Gypsy's lounge act, which wouldn't have been out of place in the lounge in the resort in the movie, but they were too busy with their white boy disco. They buried me in snow and ice. But I'm here. Of course, it would have been in really poor taste to do all these avalanche jokes at the resort in the movie. While the song itself isn't particularly elaborate, it is a wonderful showcase of Rebecca Hansen's voice, and it's that kind of pastiche of vintage entertainment styles that MST2K has always excelled at. And it's got music by Evan Schletter, who is only the best. Listen to those pipes. Pure PVC. Number nine. Growing magician. I know that you're wishing that you could do all the things that you want to and do them today. After witnessing Simon in Wizards of the Lost Kingdom fail to control an army of the dead, Jonah and Servo act out a follow-up scene where Kor the Conqueror is much more supportive than the low-rent roused hour he is in the actual movie. It's awkward and embarrassing, but it's natural and beautiful too. It's all part of the natural process, the magic inside of you. But Jonah as Kor channels his support for Servo as Simon's budding magical skills into a 50s ditty about puberty. And possibly a little bit about abstinence. Simon, someday you'll raise the undead the right way with someone you care about when you're emotionally mature enough to handle the consequences. And then you'll feel the joy of commanding an unstoppable horde of ghouls responsibly and as nature intended. 
You know, this song just confirms that more after-school specials need to be about responsible use of the dark magics. The kids need to be prepared. Finally ready for sharing the magic inside of you. Number eight. Gather round, people, run over and see the most fabulous thing in the whole galaxy. Towards the end of suffering through a movie about a crappy carnival, Jonah and the bots are visited by P.T. Mindslap, portrayed by an actor who knows his way around both space magic and criminal circus folk. Why don't we just binge season two of Fargo? No! The Great Space Circus Show! Joel Hodgson got in touch with Mark Hamill when he saw that Mark had donated to the Bring Back MST3K Kickstarter, and he asked him if he wanted to cameo on the show. So there's precedent for Kickstarter backers appearing on MST2K revivals. I, guess I backed both the Kickstarters. As they glide invisibly through the dark air. Well, who they are really, you'll never cry. No, it's the Great Space Circus Show. Mike Slap uses all his showmanship to describe the con, where you can't see anything, but you hear him describe the circus acts. It sounds dangerous with PT Mind Slap. Of strong men possessing an even stronger smell. Sniff as they lift with impossible ease. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll possibly sneeze. But I'll give him this. Doesn't sound any worse than the carnival actually in the film. Really the audience won't have a clue. Well, who you smell, really, you'll never quite know. It's the Great Space Circus Show. I'm an easy mark. Number seven. Plan to dine in the land before time. Hit me with the jingle. Plan to dine in the land before time. Moon 14. Yes, this is also less of a song and more of a sketch that has a jingle, but on the soundtrack. It's probably kosher. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? These beasts died off before God made those rules. Do it! Me from before the time. The Mads pitch their new barbecue place where you can finally taste dinosaur meat. If the dinosaurs don't taste you first. Mmm, our T Rex excellent cut. The king of dinosaurs is now king of your stomach. Uh, is he eating the band? No, no, no. Don't focus on what he's eating. Focus on what you'll be eating. Who he's eating? Whatever. Jake all that. Tiny little lungs with great big flavor. Moon 14. It's a solid sketch, and as brief as the jingle stings are, they do build on each other, getting funnier and funnier like a little punch at the end of each heightening of the premise. And I just realized I forgot to lock the Allosaurus' pen again. Uh, uh to, to, to the Moon 13 Mesozoic Panic Crew! <laughs> Never should have tampered in God's domain! No, 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 we, we, we're in serious danger, we don't need a jingle right now! Number six. Our love is on wings you can't see. In the first of Avalanche's songs, longtime Misty Neil Patrick Harris reunites with Felicia Day for another musical number about love in the time of vlogging. Sublime. Let's tie the knot online. And this time, NPH isn't stuck being the pining, unrequited third wheel. Why can't Kanga be that kind of in love with me? Is yeah, I know they're touting the praises, but boy, this makes me happy to no longer be in a long distance relationship. I mean, I'm still in that relationship. We're just married and live in the same apartment now, which is much better than when we were on opposite coasts. Still, it seems to work for them, to a point. If you have coffee breath, I'll never know. There's no physical way I could step on your toe. My love is on wings, virtually. There's no germs when you come. Huh, maybe this one was a few years ahead of its time. If you haven't yet and you are able to, please get vaccinated, everyone. I need all of your love. I don't need is you. 
course, this time it's Felicia's character who ends up heartbroken, but she still has a better end than she had last time. Dear Diary. Number five. Hit it. Ah, uh, sick beat drop. In episode two of The Gauntlet, King of Demands Jonah and the bots recapture the magic of the previous season by performing a song that will be just as beloved as their first song. Even though she didn't react at all, in earlier that very episode, they reprised a classic Emma C3K song. Open up your heart and let the magic swayze Christmas in. We're going cruising, ain't never gonna slow down. Dancing like pirates in a punks a Tony hoedown. I don't think this was necessarily a deliberate reference, but I love that this beginning has the exact same energy as... Friday night, we're gonna party till dawn. Don't worry, Daddy. I've got my favorite dress on. This is not what we had in mind. Yeah, it stinks. A and not in the joke way, it just really stinks. Well, Kinga and Max may not have been satisfied, but I think this one's a lot of fun. It's so easy to use, oh, the joke is that the song is bad, as an excuse to not put effort into a comedy song, but I don't think this one really falls into that trap. In fact, what makes me laugh about this song is how hard you do feel the effort of Jonah and the bots, the pressure to deliver, which is very relatable for anyone who's ever done creative work for hire. And then I really love how Jonah and the bots actually start to get into the groove of the song and start to enjoy it. I wish that part was always true about Work For Hire. We've built a deck with Alex Trebek, Funky Disco, and all we got on is the And on a meta level, I appreciate that Kinga is demanding that they quickly rush out something that recaptures the success of an unexpected hit while they're watching an Asylum movie. I don't know if that association was deliberate, but it really fits thematically. Number four. Yes, it's another in theater song, but it's a fully fleshed out song with instrumentation and everything that even made it onto the season's soundtrack, and I'm glad it did because it's a jam. On the castle run, yeah, nobody can, can touch, touch her. Let me be the Picard to your Beverly Crusher. The gangway's extended, and we're ready to go. To cover a long stretch of our leading lady slowly boarding a spaceship, Paul and Storm cram every sci fi reference they can into a Beach Boys pastiche. She looks like a kitty cat, but runs like an ace. It's a Canadian slave one, can't keep the pace. Whitley Stryber and Ranieri gonna join in the race. Yeah, my UFO's the coolest GTO in space. A flying the cliches of California car songs to spaceships of the silver screen is a game that works really well, and the song is as catchy as any actual Beach Boys song, without needing to worry about royalties going to Mike Love. But to Barada, Nanu, Nanu, make it so, and climb into the side of a complete stranger's UFO. Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. What a mistake. Don't do it. No. Number three. I see seaweed and more seaweed. Say, I think I see a rave. No, it's just seaweed. Another in theater song, and this is one they go all out for, bringing in Waverly Growler and Gypsy. Dice below the dam. Hey, look, an old rusty shopping cart. I see a MacGuffin. There's the poor man's Richard Chamberlain. Never wear white to a suicide mission. It looks like this was a particularly slow bit of movie, and they did have some spoken riffs for it interjected between the music, but there's still plenty of time to kill with some singing. But though I don't see Barracuda or a school of Ahi tuna, I'll still rip off Jaws 1 and 2 and 3. Tell my story. Oh my god, that's Tony. I didn't recognize him. He lost weight. Actually, I'm a spreader. What are you gonna do? I'm dead! In fact, there's so much time to kill, they can even stop to rip their own song. You can spray your poison spray can, we'll still chew you up like bacon. Okay, hold on. Hang in there a second, tin and can well. I let a lot of imperfect rhymes go by in this song, and I didn't say anything, but bacon? It's not even a real word as far as I know. Ah, zip it, Kelsey Grammer. But it honestly does make this stretch fly by. It's an unexpected masterwork of pacing as the sung verses and the spoken riffs weave into each other unexpectedly well. Double cross speed. Damn. Hey, language. Strain my heart. Me, me, me. From the title, you might expect this to be an under-the-sea sound alike, and it's not quite that. 
but there is a possible lyrical name drop of another Mankin and Ashman Disney song. Be our guest while we ingest you and of all your flesh to vest you. Big show is finished, gang! Oh, so this song gets closure. Still waiting on that end for Push Past the Hurting. Before they turn you into spam. We really mean it. What is taking her so long? Also, it has nothing to do with the song itself, but I do have to note that this song occurs about a minute or so after one of the many great theme park jokes in these seasons. I can't believe this. There's never not a line for the Finding Nemo submarine voyage. There must be a parade going on, or I don't know, people got wise that it's just some cartoons projected on a window. I'm going back to Universal. I sailed all the way to the Jurassic Park ride. You know, I never realized how many Universal rides look like concrete bunkers in the jungle. This is what happens when you mix in some SoCal nerds with the Minnesota nerds in the riding staff. Number two. Reptilicus is silly, but he really illustrates the great array of monsters all over the place. Not the first host segment interrupting the first movie of the long-awaited revival had a lot riding on it, and boy, howdy did it deliver. Jeez, easy peasy, Mesa amaze. Seeing the Yucatan, you can meet El Cadejo and believe they believe in him, they're not afraid to say so. Confused by Reptilicus's country of origin, the bots asked Jonah to explain all sorts of kaiju from all across the world. Well, duh, Crow, there's a lot that could kill you. Hey. Prom. Sorry, Crow. Okay. Gross. Joe. Yo, Jonah, How's the chorus go? Every country has a monster they're afraid of. And it's a perfect use of so many of Paul and Storm's talents. Their mastery of wordplay, their ability to deep dive into obscure information, and their catchy as all get out compositions. It might be the best song they've written for a beloved franchise since Ballad of the Sneak. What turned the Mustard's guts to spaghetti? Was it in Tibet? Yep. I bet he met a Yeti. Australia? Bear drop bears will impale ya. Then they'll sell ya hella touristy paraphernalia. And they even managed to work in shout outs to both bare naked ladies. Chickeny China, the Chinese chicken! By that I mean Zhu Fang and Peng, mm. giant Chinese birds, and oh. one of them yeah, yeah, yeah. turns into a fish. And Def Leppard. Or possibly the offspring. Guter Gleben, Glauten, Kroben. And the performance by Jonah and the bots is really impressive. I can't imagine how much rehearsal and how many takes it took to get this right without flubbing any major lines. I can barely get through one line of this script without flubbing, and I'm looking at a teleprompter. Might not want to admit that if I'm trying to get hired. For many fans, this song was confirmation that we were in good hands with this revival, and Jonah scrambling with the props was reassurance that despite the increased budget, we would still get some of the homemade charm of the original series. Every monster has a country. Yeah, we got movie signs. And my number one favorite song from the Netflix seasons of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Hit it, Joe! What? What? So the word on the street is you got a little movie about time, in particular the day it's gonna end. Huh? Well, friends, an ordinary movie man might make an unassuming 3X structure. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm a sucker for a Music Man parody. Of course this is my favorite song from the revival. So yeah, I would be predisposed to like this one, even if it wasn't an absolutely perfect fit for this movie. Gonna be a doozy. You can't lose when you choose to use a lot of concepts. Concepts? Concepts. Gotta stock them up chock full of concepts, premises, plot points, anything and everything. Throw them all at the wall, y'all. Just pack in the A powder song is really the only way to do justice to the sheer amount of stuff that the daytime ended throws at its audience and a flim flam man trying to sell that stuff to the screenwriters makes as much sense as any explanation. But can you help us apply this method to our movie? Darn tootin'. Everybody throw on a skimmer hat and a one-piece striped bathing suit. Let's dive right in. <laughs> Octagonal solar powerhouse in the desert with a stable in the back. Not bad for the start, but pals, let me ask you, how's about a pyramid? A pyramid? Great big green going pyramid. The first time we watched this episode, as soon as Servo showed up in that Harold Hill getup, Ali turned to me and said, I'm so happy for you right now. My wife knows me well. Dancing in the bedroom, naked as a light green jaybird. Has he got a single thing to do with the moving of the plot? Who cares? I know, did I mention? You're gonna need a kettle full of spaceships. Spaceships! Yeah. Also, this episode had two great Disneyland jokes. Wait, this is Radiator Springs? The Imagineers really phoned it in on this one. Yeesh. Pays to get there early for Fantasmic. The only way the show could hammer me any harder is by hiring me. Yeah. Ah, who am I kidding? I could never be half the Robert Preston that Baron Vaughn is. Bring on and on and on and on those cons. And that's
that's my ranking of songs from MSC3K The Return and MSC3K The Gauntlet. And I can't wait for more song sketches and riffing when the Gizmoplex opens. But what about you? Which songs from these two seasons were your favorites? Let's discuss this all in the comments, and until next time, this is Dave, signing off. Thank you.